Welcome to New Life, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And we're so excited to worship together with you. If this is your first time joining us, um, if you could just take a moment and fill out our connection card at the newlife.church forward slash live. Uh, if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, it's in the description, the link to go to that. If you could just take a minute and fill that out, we would greatly appreciate that. Thank you once again for joining us. Now let's jump in to Pastor David's message. Hi, New Life. Welcome to today's service. I'm so thankful that you're here and that you're watching uh, with us. Take a moment and just say hi in the comments. We're so thankful that you're here and we're looking forward to a great time together in God's Word. Uh, before we get into today's message, take a moment, say hi in the comments so we can connect with you. And then also take, take, a, take a minute to share this with a friend or share it on your, share it on your Facebook. So uh, we want to get the Word out and we want people to be impacted by God's Word. So thank you for being here. And if today is your first time, I'm so thankful that you chose to worship with us. Right now we are in a sermon series that we're calling Roadblocks. Everyone hates it whenever the highway is shut down by roadblocks and you can't get to your destination. And we're talking about spiritual roadblocks that get in the way of life and faith. So we're trying to overcome those. Uh, so, so far we have talked about familiarity, the roadblock of familiarity, where we just get so comfortable uh, with what God has given us that we don't appreciate it. Last week we talked about pride. And now this week we're going to continue this series of roadblocks and we're going to talk about selfishness. We're going to talk about selfishness today, which really uh, is in many ways the fruit of pride. If pride is the root, then the fruit of it is often selfishness. So today we're really looking forward to getting into God's Word. Take a moment to share it. Say hi. We're so thankful that you're here. I'm excited about what we're going to learn from God's Word today. Let's just take a moment to pray and ask God to bless this time, and then we'll dive into God's Word in Mark chapter 6. Father, thank you so much for today and for the opportunity that we have to study your word. God, I pray that you'd be with me as I, as I preach. I pray that you'd help me to say only what you want me to say and nothing, nothing more, nothing less. I ask that you'd be with the people who are watching right now. I pray that you'd fill them with your spirit. I, I ask that you, that you would teach them what you want for them to learn and be encouraged by today. And we pray that you just do amazing things in our time together as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Don't you love bridezillas? Uh, I saw this article that was written about this real bride who wrote instructions to all the guests who were going to come to her, her wedding, and the instructions read something like this. Uh, it read, if you're going to show up to the wedding, first of all, you have to be there 30 minutes early. Number two, uh, ladies, you are not allowed to wear, or no one is allowed to wear white cream or ivory. Uh, to me, all of those are white, uh, but you're not allowed to wear any of those. Number three, ladies, you have to either have your hair in a ponytail or a bob. Uh, you have to have that. Number four, uh, you have to wear minimal makeup so you don't show up the bride. Rule number five, uh, you are not allowed to speak to the bride one time the entire day. Number six, uh, you can't get on Facebook or until you are instructed to do so and only use this hashtag and use a certain hashtag with everything that you post on that day. Next, I think we already said no makeup for the ladies so you don't show up the bride. And then finally, and most importantly, if you want to be allowed to attend the wedding, you have to present a gift that is worth $75 or more. Talk about a bridezilla. Talk about, man, well, I, part of me would be thankful if I got that list because I'd be like, all right, I can't, I can't attend that, that I can't afford that, that $75 gift. But man, you know, so, bridezillas, what, what a fun experience. And if you were a bridezilla, I just want to take a second and apologize. But second, you probably weren't a bridezilla like that. So that's just so crazy. The pride, the selfishness that all goes into it. And as we get into Mark chapter number six today, what we see is we see a way to overcome selfishness. Last week we talked about pride and we saw the pride of Herod and we saw the pride of Herodias and how they just thought of themselves with everything that they did. And today what we're really going to see is we are going to see a solution. Today in Mark chapter six, Jesus has met with his disciples and he's going with them uh, he's going with them on a trip where they're going to get away for a little while. They're going to get some time to rest. 
And when, when this happens, everyone hears about where Jesus is at. They come to Jesus and Jesus does something amazing in their lives. And what this is going to teach us today is it's going to teach us how to overcome the roadblock of selfishness, just living for ourselves, living in a self-serving way. So let's go ahead and get into God's word. Mark chapter number six. Let's go ahead and get, begin reading in verse number 30. The Bible says, and the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. So if you remember last week, we talked about Jesus. He sent out his disciples to go preach throughout all of Israel that Jesus, the Messiah, had come. He gave them the authority and the power to perform miracles. Uh, and they've traveled all over Israel preaching uh, about Jesus. And Jesus' influence has multiplied and his influences has spread around Israel. And now here in verse 30, the Bible tells us that the disciples meet back up with Jesus. So Jesus has sent them out. And now they have all come back to Jesus, and really they're giving Jesus a report of their experiences. And then in verse number 31, it says that Jesus said to them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. So Jesus hears their report, and he hears about all that has happened. I just imagine Peter saying, you know, Jesus, I can't believe it. I, I spoke and there was this man who he couldn't walk before. And then I just said, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And then there he was walking. I, I picture Andrew saying, hey, I, I told this lady about you, Jesus, and, and she believed you. And then her, she, she received her sight. Or, uh, I, I, I imagine Philip speaking to Jesus and saying, Jesus, there was this man who he was going to die. And then I said, in the name of Jesus, get up. And he was immediately healed. It was amazing. But as they're speaking to Jesus, Jesus also knows, notices that they're tired. They're tired. They, they've been working hard for Jesus. They've been doing amazing things. And Jesus says, hey, you guys, you guys need a break. And it says they were so busy that they didn't even really have any downtime to, to grab a meal. People were surrounding them. People wanted to see them. People wanted to hear from them. People wanted to, to have miracles performed for them. And Jesus says, hey, let's get, let's get away for a little bit. Let's rest for a little bit. And, and I just want to pause for a moment and say, as we talk about selfishness today, as we, as we talk about how to overcome selfishness in our lives, I think that we need to make a, a we need to show that there's a difference between self-care and and selfishness. Uh, that there's a difference that here in scripture, Jesus sees that these men are tired and he says, hey, you need to take a moment to rest. The word is you need to, the word here, whenever he says uh, rest, he's saying, hey, you need to rest from your weariness. You're tired. You've been working hard. Take a moment to, to come apart. Take a moment to, to catch your breath. Take a moment so that you don't burn yourself out. Make sure that you are staying healthy physically, emotionally, spiritually. And I would just like to challenge you this, this, this morning as, as, we're, as we go through this and as we talk about selfishness, to not neglect, we're not talking about neglecting, taking care of what God has given you in your body and your spirit and your mind. God gave that to you as a gift to be stewarded. So, so we need to make sure that we are, that we're taking care of our, our health. Make sure that we're, that we're eating well. That's something that's difficult for me. I, I'm the first to admit, I like my chocolate chip cookies and my chocolate ice cream. And it, pretty much if it has the word chocolate in it, I'm all about it. Um, so, but make sure that you're eating right. Make, make sure that you're getting uh, good rest. Make sure that you're sleeping. Make, make sure that you're taking time to be with your family and make sure that you're taking time just, just to slow down from, from weariness. And that's what Jesus is recommending here. Jesus is saying, hey, take some time alone with me. And by the way, we don't want to neglect our spiritual health. We don't want to take time. To, we don't want to neglect our spiritual health. That, in, that we, we tend to our spiritual health by being a part of services, by hearing God's word preach. But I would say just as important, if not more important, is that on a daily basis, you should have some time where you are reading God's word, where you're taking time to pray and really walk with Jesus. And if you would like help with that, if you say, hey, I've never done that before. I've never developed the habit of uh, the discipline of walking with Jesus on a daily basis, would you please let us know and let us know in the comments or through a direct message. We would love to get you some resources. We'd love to help you grow in a personal relationship with Jesus. That's what it's all about here. We, we believe that you'll find new life when you do that. So we see here that Jesus says, hey, take a minute, take a minute and rest. 
So they go off, and it says that they go into a desert place. They just go to a place where they can get some quiet, a place where they can be alone for a little bit. Uh, and we see here that it says that they departed into a desert place by ship privately. It says, and the people saw them. So the crowds that are looking for Jesus and the disciples, they saw him, many knew him. And it says that they ran a foot thither out of all the cities and out went them and came together unto him. So they hear, they hear Jesus where he's at and they are rushing to be where he is. So by this point in Jesus's ministry, Jesus has definitely reached really a celebrity status where they want to be around Jesus at all times to see what he's going to say, to hear what he's going to, to hear what he's going to say, uh, to see what he's going to do. They want to see Jesus's miracles. So they're all around him. And it says that they run after him which would have been a hard moment. It would, have been, it would have been difficult when you're wanting rest and people are looking for you. And then it says, when Jesus came out, he saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them. So he sees these people looking for him and it says that he's in his heart, he's moved with compassion. And we're gonna come back to that in just a moment. But it says, because they were a sheep, not having a shepherd. Now, as they're writing this in, in first century, to writing to a first century Jewish audience, uh, shepherding was a big deal in Israel and Jewish culture. Uh, most people were shepherds or dealt with animals. And Jesus sees them and he says, hey, they remind me like sheep who are all alone, who don't have someone to care for them. Uh, I need to care for them. I love them. I care for them. And he, he's moved with compassion for them like a sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So he feeds them spiritually by teaching them and says, and when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place. And now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, give ye them to eat. So they say, Jesus, we need to, we need to stop this service. Uh, you need to stop teaching because these people are getting hungry. They need to get into town so they can eat. And Jesus says, hey, what? I want you guys, I want you guys to feed them. Now, he's saying that knowing that they don't have the money to feed them. He's saying that knowing that they don't have the resources to feed them. But he said, hey, I want, I want you guys to feed them. And they say, Jesus, how, how can we do that? We, uh, if we had nine months wages that were 200 penny worth or 200 denarii, hey, we don't, we don't, have, we don't have that kind of money. We don't have those resources so Jesus says, well, what do you have? What do you have? Uh, what a great question. Jesus, Jesus had an expectation from them. And when they said, hey, we don't, we're not, we're, we don't have enough. Jesus said, well, what do you have? And my friend, it doesn't matter where you are in life. God can allow, God wants you to be a part of his work. God wants you to be a part of what he's doing and he can enable you to be a part of what he's, what he is doing. So he says, what do you have? And it says in verse 38, it says, how many loaves have ye? And they said, when they knew, they say five and two fish. So Jesus says, hey, what do you guys have? They come back and they say, Jesus, we have five loaves and two fish. Now we know from another passage, we know from John that they actually find five little pieces of bread and two fish off of a little boy. So there's a boy who came, he probably came to hear Jesus and this boy brought a little sack lunch and they, and they bring this boy to Jesus and they say, Jesus, hey, this boy has five loaves, five little pieces of bread and two fish. But what are they among so many? You see, now the crowd is surpassing thousands and thousands of people. We're going to see in just a moment that there are 5,000 men plus women and children who are here hearing Jesus speak. I don't care how big the bread is. That's not enough to feed 5,000 people. But they say, Jesus, this is what we have. So Jesus takes it and Jesus does something amazing with it. He takes it, he breaks it, he blesses it, he prays over it, and then he starts giving it to his disciples. He says, all right, I want you to get everybody to sit down. I want you to sit them, sit them down in an organized way. So they sit down in groups of, uh, of 50 and in groups of 100, and they sit down in small groups, and then he gives the bread and the fish to these disciples, and they go out and they give the bread and fish to everyone. It was an amazing day. 
Jesus is taking the bread and he's just, he's breaking off a piece and giving it to one guy. And he's taking, he's breaking off another piece and giving it to somebody else. And he's just, he's just peeling it apart and handing it out. And they're just taking it. And then they come back for more. And Jesus still has more. And Jesus is feeding thousands of people with a little boy's sack lunch. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Just He takes this little lunch and Jesus does the miraculous. He feeds a multitude with one little boy's lunch. Now, for me, it, it would just be cool if everyone, no matter how small you break apart the pieces, if everyone got a bite of that five loaves and two fish. But then it says, it's really interesting, it says that everyone was full. Jesus fed them spiritually, and he, he fed them physically. Jesus cares about your spiritual needs. He cares about your physical needs. Jesus said, uh, uh, do not worry uh, about what you shall eat or what you shall drink uh, or, or what you will wear. The life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus cares about our spiritual needs. He cares about our physical needs. We can take those to him. And Jesus meets everyone's need and not just giving them a bite to eat, to get them by, he fills them up. And that's something that just encourages me. Everything that Jesus does, Jesus does well. Jesus does well. He feeds them until they are full, until they don't want anymore. And then he has them gather up all of the fragments. He has, the, he has them gather up all of the leftovers. And then they bring home 12 baskets, 12 baskets full of bread, of bread from, from this moment. That's what Jesus does. That's what he does in this passage. And, and what, how does this teach us about selfishness? How does this teach us about how to overcome selfishness? Well, we're going to see this in just a moment, but I just want to paint this picture for, for you from where we were last week and where we are now. You remember last week, Herod, the, the pseudo king, Herod, the Tetrarch, who just, he, he has his little part of Israel, but he's really under Roman rule. And remember how last week we talked about how he set up a banquet for himself to celebrate his birthday. He, he invites a few people uh, that he respects, a few people that he wants them to think highly of him. And he sets up a banquet for them and he feeds them for his own selfish purposes. Well, now here we see Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he is setting up a banquet on a hillside for the multitudes, for everyone, for people who can't do anything for him, for, for this little boy who all he has to offer is five loaves and two fish. And Herod, Herod the pseudo-king, is offering food to people who can give him something in return. Jesus, the king of kings, is giving everyone a meal because he loves and he cares for them. So we're going to see Jesus give a great example of how to overcome selfishness. So let's look at this passage and see how to overcome selfishness. I have just a few, uh, a few observations from this passage. First of all, we see this. If we're going to overcome selfishness, it's going to happen when we see what Jesus, what Jesus sees. We overcome selfishness when we see how Jesus sees. Here in this, in this text, Jesus and his disciples, they, they want to get apart. They want to get away. They want to rest. But then he sees people. And he doesn't see people as a problem to get rid of. He sees them as people to be loved. And Jesus sees the multitude and it says that he's moved with compassion. My friend, if we are going to overcome selfishness, it's going to happen when we look at people the same way that Jesus looks at people. Whenever we don't see uh, that homeless person as, as someone who is in our way or, somebody, or someone who's just who's out there uh, to bother us, but whenever we look and see that, hey, there is a soul, a person who needs to be loved, a person who needs to know the love of Jesus. Whenever we look at uh, our family members, and, and, and in the middle of, uh, of a season where, where sometimes we can get on each other's nerves, and we need to stop looking at family members as people who get on our nerves, but instead we need to look at them as a gift from God. We need to stop looking at our, our supervisor or our coworker as somebody who just gets under our skin, but we need to look at them as a human soul. We need to look at people the same way that Jesus looks at people. And whenever he saw them, he was moved with compassion. And we as followers of Jesus need to love like Jesus and see how Jesus sees and be moved with compassion ourselves and love the people that God has put in our path. We see that we need to see how Jesus 
sees. And when, we're, when we have compassion, it makes all the difference in people's lives. It reminds me of, of a lady, uh, an older lady, who she would always go whenever she needed to mail something. She would go to the post office. She would stand in line for the counter to get her stamps. Someone finally told this older lady, they said, hey, you know, there's the stamp machine over there. You can go and you can pay for it. It's automated. There's no line. And you're going to get in and out much, much quicker. And her reply was this. Well, she said, she said, well, that's all fine and good, but the stamp machine doesn't ask me about my arthritis. Here's what she was saying. She was saying, hey, there's somebody at the counter who will have a personal interaction with me, who cares about where I'm at, who cares about what I'm going through. And that means more to me than anything else. And my friend, whenever we are moved with compassion for other people, there's no telling what difference that will make in other people's lives. There's no telling what difference it will make in our lives. We need to see how Jesus sees. But then I also notice. In this, in this passage, that if we're going to overcome selfishness, we need to serve with what we have. We need to serve with what we have. A lot of people have the mindset, uh, and maybe you're watching and you've thought, hey, you know what? If I won the lottery, then I would give. Have you ever, have you ever had that hypothetical situation happen? Maybe it's just me where I thought, man, how cool would it be if I, like, if I won uh, $10 million somehow, and then I could, then I could, then I could take care of, uh, I could take care of my church's needs, and then I could do this, and I could take care of whatever, and a lot of times we get so busy thinking about hypothetical situations about what we would do that we never actually do what we can do. We need to serve with what we have. Whenever I first started in ministry, I started off as a youth pastor and I got to work with teenagers. And whenever I first started, I had just graduated from Bible college. So I was 21, 22. And the church that I served at, uh, they, had a, they had a ruler because of their insurance that you couldn't drive their church vehicles until you were 25. So I started in ministry, I'm 22 and I can't drive the van until I'm 25, which led to a problem because we would have activities and events and different things that we do for the teenagers where we would go somewhere, go on an activity, go do an event uh, somewhere. And we traveled maybe from Baytown to, to Baybrook and we'd, we'd make those trips. But if we were going to do that, I always had to find a driver because uh, I couldn't do it myself. Well, uh, whenever I first started People who were godsends to me was Paul and Debbie. Paul and Debbie, and you know what? Paul and Debbie are probably watching this. Paul and Debbie, if you're watching, uh, say hi to everybody so everybody knows uh, who you are. But Paul and Debbie, you know, I don't know that they that they ever had a lot, but Paul and Debbie loved uh, the teens that were in our church, and uh, they were they were always willing to give of their time. So whenever I needed a driver to activities, whenever I needed a driver to events. They would volunteer. They would take us. And uh, those poor people, this, uh, the, these, those poor people who would listen uh, to teenagers, you know, yelling and screaming and singing and being crazy in the back, they would just be up there sweetly driving. And because they loved, uh, they loved, I believe that they loved uh, me and my family and they loved our teenagers and they loved our church. So they were willing to serve. They didn't have a lot, but they were willing to serve with what they had. And here I am six years later, telling you about that because it made a difference in my life. And what we see here in this passage is that Jesus, Jesus could have just made bread appear out of nowhere, but he doesn't do that. He wants his disciples, he wants his followers to be a part of what he's doing. Whenever they say, hey, Jesus, how are we going to feed them? We don't have, uh, we don't have anything to feed them with. We don't have the money uh, to buy food for them. We don't have the bread on hand. And Jesus says, well, what do you have? You don't have to have a lot for Jesus to use it in an incredible way. You don't have to have a lot to be a part of miraculous things that God wants to do. You just have to be willing to serve with what you have. Maybe you're, you're listening and you say, hey, I, I want to be a part. I want to serve. I, I want to be a part of what God is doing. But you don't exactly know how to do that. Please reach out to us uh, in a direct message or comment. Say, hey, I want to be a part. I want to serve. And we'd love, to, we'd love to find out where you're gifted and where, where you enjoy serving and help you serve Jesus's family, Jesus's church, uh, serve our community and those in need uh, with your giftings, with what you have. And that's what Jesus expects of his followers. He says, serve with what you have. The third principle that I noticed here 
is if we're going to overcome selfishness, we have to be intentional with what we do. We have to be intentional with what we do. You know, if we're not intentional with how we live, then we, we always slide into being lackadaisical. We always slide into being uh, self-serving. We always uh, tend to drift towards pride. And if we're going to overcome selfishness, we have to be intentional with what we do. How do we see this in this text? Well, we see it whenever Jesus tells his disciples, hey, what do you have? And they say, we have five loaves and two fish. And Jesus says, hey, have everyone sit down in groups. So the disciples, they go out and they have everyone, they have everyone sit down in an organized manner, in an organized fashion, so they could quickly and so they could, uh, in the best way possible, get the food to the masses. So they do this in an organized way. And that's what Jesus expects of us. The Bible says they let all things be done decently and in order. We have been given a stewardship. We have been entrusted by God with the gospel, the good news that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and for mine. We have been entrusted with the good news to steward for Jesus's glory. And, and we need to be intentional with how we live that out. We need to be intentional. When we live purposeless, we live selfishly. Uh, it reminds me, uh, speaking of purpose, it reminds me of President Ulysses S. Grant, the first time that he played golf. Uh, he, went, he, he went out and he played golf for the first time and uh, he took his club and there was the ball on the tee and he took it and he started swinging at it. And he hit the dirt and dirt started flying everywhere and got up in his beard. He swung and he missed. Uh, he swung and he missed. Uh, I don't know if swung is the correct, uh, is grammatically correct. Forgive me if I'm wrong. I'll beat myself up later if I'm wrong. Uh, so, but he would swing and he would miss and... And finally, he said, you know, uh, this golf game, uh, it makes for really good exercise, but I don't really understand what the purpose of the ball is. Uh, he was there and he was like, hey, there's just no, there's no purpose here. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And we don't want to be like that golf ball that doesn't go anywhere, that doesn't do anything, that doesn't accomplish anything that's purposeless. We want to be intentional. So how do we live intentionally? Int intentional living is just living where we where we where we find the purpose in everything that we do. We do everything that we do, we do for a reason. We do to love Jesus more. We do to love people like Jesus. Uh, some people who live intentionally that I've seen in business, uh, I, read, I read in the book High Performance Habits by Brendan Burchard, I read uh, about Oprah Winfrey. Whenever she goes into meetings uh, with people, she always opens up with the same questions. She says, what is the purpose of this meeting? Uh, why are we here? Uh, she asks those questions when she starts every single meeting so that it's intentional. Uh, the news anchor, Dan Rather, who uh, he was a news anchor for decades, he, he had this question written in his wallet, in his pocket, on, on his desk. So no matter where he went, he always had this with him. He said, what am I doing to make the broadcast better right now? What am I doing right now to make the broadcast better? And just those kind of intentional questions, those intentional moments uh, cause us to live intentionally. And if we're going to avoid selfishness, we have to do so intentionally. So ask yourself this question, what am I doing to serve others right now? Ask this question, who am I serving right now? When, if we're not intentional about it, we won't do it. So the first principle that we saw is if we're gonna be, if we're gonna overcome the roadblock of selfishness, we need to see how Jesus sees. We need to serve with what we have. We need to be intentional with what we do. And when we do that, we'll experience what Jesus does. We'll experience what Jesus does. The disciples, they did the followers of Jesus. They did what they could do. They organized everyone. They were ready to receive the bread. They were ready to receive the miracle. And then Jesus takes it and he breaks apart the bread and he gives it out and he gives it out and he gives it out and he gives it out. And when the disciples did what they could do, when they were intentional with their part, with their assignment, then Jesus did what he could do. And my friend, whenever we choose to live selflessly, when we choose to serve others, Jesus can do amazing things in and through our lives. He does the miraculous in 
and through our lives, but we have to choose to live selflessly. We have to choose to be obedient to him. We have to choose to live for Jesus's honor and glory, not for our own honor and glory. We see that in the life of Jesus. The night before Jesus was crucified, Jesus was having a dinner with his disciples. And in Eastern culture in the first century, uh, it was it was the cultural norm for people to wash their feet uh, whenever they went to someone's house. If, if it was people who were of lower income or uh, middle class, if you will, then the host, the 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 person who's who was the host in the house, he would provide water. He'd give a water bowl for every for all of his guests to wash their own feet. But if someone was more wealthy, then they would get their lowest servant to wash their guest's feet. It was the lowest position that you could have to be a servant washing people's feet. And Jesus, when he's at his last supper with his disciples, Jesus, the son of God, Jesus, their teacher, their leader, the Bible says that he gets out a bowl and he gets a towel and he washes his disciples' feet. Jesus the Son of God, serving people. And this is what Jesus said to them. He said, you've seen how I washed your feet. Now you go and wash other people's feet. Now, I don't believe that he was saying literally that we all need to go around washing each other's feet. But here's what he was saying. He was saying, hey, serve others. Serve others. Live selflessly. Live like Jesus lived. And then, of course, the ultimate demonstration of selflessness. When Jesus was when Jesus selflessly sacrificed himself on the cross to pay for your sins and to pay for my sins. Jesus, the son of God, sacrificed himself, gave up his life so you and I could live. Greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus died to pay for your sins so you could be forgiven, so you could have a relationship with God. And my friend, I would like to encourage you, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, you can do that right now here in this moment. If you mean it from your heart, pray with me. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I say you'd forgive my sin and give me a relationship with you. I believe that Jesus died and that he rose again to pay for my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. If you did that, if you just pray that and you meant that from your heart, Jesus has forgiven your sins. He's made you a part of his family. And there's nothing more wonderful than that. And it's all because of the sacrifice, the selfless sacrifice that Jesus made to pay for your sins and to pay for my sins. And if you did that, we're so thankful that you did it. And if you know Jesus as your savior, let me challenge you and encourage you to love like Jesus this week, selflessly serve others. Thank you for being a part of today's service. God bless you. We're looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for joining us today for our service. We hope it's been a blessing and an encouragement to you. If there's anything that we can do for you or pray for you about, please send us a direct message on Facebook or Instagram or send us an email at info at thenewlife.church. If you have been blessed uh, by this message and you want to support our ministry, you can do so at thenewlife.church. We would greatly appreciate that. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time.